All right. Hey, it is good to be here today. It is a beautiful Sunday. Going to be in the 70s today. I'm so excited. I have not liked the weather with the rain and all that kind of thing. So uh, really looking forward to today. Uh, if we have not met one another, uh, I know I've been here a number of weeks, but if you're new to the church, uh, my name is John West. I serve uh, on staff at a ministry called Mobilize the Church. Uh, he was trying to say, like, what, what's your title? I'm like, I don't know, pastor, author, father, husband, nonprofit director, friend of Andy. I mean, I don't know. So anyway, we, we just decided to go with that. But it's really good to be here today. Andy's a little under the weather, and so uh, I wanted to step in and, and just share with you uh, the good news. That's the ser series we're in, the good news. Uh, we need some good news. I don't know if you uh, checked the, the uh, news reports lately, but a lot of drama going on in our world. Uh, have you seen probably the strikes from Iran to Israel and the response that the U.S. is making, pulling together world leaders? Uh, you know, it just feels like we're in a very precarious time not only as a country, but as a world and our society. And everywhere you turn, it feels like there's some new bad news that we have to look at. And uh, today we're going to talk about good news. How many would like to do that? Talk about some good news today? Yeah. Because, and I really mean this, as followers of Jesus, like we have the hope for the hopeless. We are the light in the darkness. Like we are the ones that the Lord uses to bring that new life and that good news to our society. So anyway, today we're going we're gonna to dive into that a little bit. And uh, we're going to enter a world very different than our own today. I'm just going to give you a little heads up. We're going to take a journey into uh, a very different world than, say, our current United States of America. It's going to be a world that feels a little bit more like this, okay? We're going to go back to a time when there were temples and sacrifice and priests and priestesses and blood and dying animals on altars, and it's going to feel really weird for a lot of you that are used to iPhones and social media and kind of our modern society. But unless we go back into this world right here, uh, I don't know, maybe it's not quite like that, but sort of like this, you will not understand what Christ has done for you. I don't think you can understand the good news until you kind of get a taste of what life used to be like. And so that's kind of the journey we're going to go on. And at the end of our journey, I pray that God will open your eyes to like a fresh new vision for who Jesus is, what he has done, and the fact that you don't have to continue striving to try to please him. Okay, so turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to dive into Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to start with verse 22. You will see it on the screen. This is out of the English Standard Version. Uh, but I want to read this for you. So I think it's really important uh, for us to understand when it comes to Jesus. So indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Let me just stop and say, I don't know why that's the case. I don't know why that's how God set it up. But he did set it up to say that when you fall into sin and transgress one of his rules, blood sacrifice is required. There has to be blood. So without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Let's keep go to the next one. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. The copies would be like the tabernacle, the temple, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Okay, keep rolling. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. So Jesus, through the cross, did something different than what happened in the earthly sacrifice. And it wasn't to offer himself, Jesus, repeatedly, as the high priest, right, enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. That's not what Jesus came to do. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, Jesus appeared once and for all at the end of time to put away sin 
by the sacrifice of himself. So the title today is Blood and Sacrifice. And again, some of you are going to say, what did we just get ourselves into today? Uh, but that's what I want to talk about. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the things we just sang. Like you are a good, good father. You are a perfect sacrifice. You are our living hope. You are so much for us. And Lord, I pray today that we would begin to have a fresh vision for what you did for us on the cross. And that we would see the good news in a new light. Maybe a light that we've never understood fully before. But today, I pray, God, you'd open our eyes through the power of your spirit to see things we've never seen before. To, to draw connections we've never seen before, Lord. And if there's someone in this room right now that's sitting here trying their hardest to fill the hole in their heart or trying their hardest to make the sacrifice needed to be at peace with you, I pray, Lord, you would show them something new, a new way today. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews 9.26. Let's watch. Look at this one more time. Jesus has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So let's talk about sacrifice for just a minute. And we could start this journey a lot of different places. We could go all the way back to Adam and Eve and do it that way. But what I'd like to do instead is I would like for us to start with a woman that we're going to call a Pagan Patty. All right. Everyone say, hi, Pagan Patty. I, I don't know. I don't have a picture of her, but she's really, man, she's not a looker at all. Uh, she's a pagan, okay? And she's Pagan Patty. And she lives 5,000 years ago in ancient Mesopotamia. And Pagan Patty one day uh, realizes that, you know, in order for me to survive, I have to make sure that these crops are able to grow. And I have to make sure these animals can survive. And one thing I've noticed is that in order for my crops to grow and for my animals to survive, that big ball of light in the sun has to shine in a certain way. It can't be too close or it'll singe the plant and kill the plant, but if it's too far away, the plant won't survive. Peg and Patty, a week ago, if she would have seen the solar eclipse that we all witnessed, probably would have freaked out that maybe perhaps the powers in the sky are angry or uncertain with her. Peg and Patty also realizes that in order for her plants and her animals to survive, there has to be uh, this, this water that kind of falls from the sky. And periodically, as this water falls from the sky, if there's too much of that water, it will wash away the plants. And if there's not enough water, they will dry up. And so she starts to realize over time that perhaps if she could get the, the ball of fire in the sky and the water to fall at a certain rate, she would be okay. And then her husband notices that every time he goes out to try to kill animals, sometimes they fall right into the trap. Sometimes when, when they're like in the hunt with a bunch of other pagan men, right, uh, and they're in the hunt, sometimes the animals just like fall into the trap. Other times, it's like the animals are super elusive and they get out of every possible scenario they try to set. And the man begins to say, there must be someone controlling the animals and the hunt. And then the man and the woman notice that the ball of light in the night sky as it travels across the course of 30 days begins to change shape. And the changing of the moon in the night sky also correlates with the changing in the woman's body who every 30 days is on a specific cycle. And the cycle of the moon and the cycle of her body are somehow synced up. And the man and woman find that at certain nights when the cycle of the moon and the cycle of her body are synced up and there happens to be uh, candles and a bottle of wine involved, <laughs> they can actually create life. And that life can then create other life. And so all of a sudden, Peg and Patty and her husband come to the realization that there are forces and there are gods that are outside of their control that they have to learn how to interact with and manipulate. And in Mesopotamia, an ancient civilization, ancient society, they begin to give names to these different 
uh, forces that were out there. And so they would call El the father god and Sham the sky god, Baal the lightning god, Nana the god of the moon, and Utu the god of the sun. Give it up for Utu. Yeah. These names would evolve. This whole like names of gods and goddesses and, and forces in the sky would start to evolve and they began to realize that maybe if we were to just appease the gods, we could find a way to manipulate them to do what we want. And so what happened is, as soon as the gods seemed to bless them with an abundant crop, they would take some of their crop and they would offer it back to the gods to say thank you as a grateful offering to them. And sometimes when the man went out to the hunt and the animals were easily ensnared and they brought home many animals for food, they would create an altar there and they would offer some of the animals to the god of the hunt to say thank you for what you've done. And eventually an entire sacrifice system was evolved. So if it wasn't raining in a certain region, well, then you would offer a sacrifice in that region. You would build an altar there. And if in this region over here you wanted to procreate and have more children, well, then you would build an altar to the moon god. And you would start this entire sacrificial system in the process. But Pagan Patty had a problem. And her man friend also had a problem. It seemed that the sacrifices were never quite enough. Because what would happen is whenever the crops like yielded an incredible crop, well, then they would sacrifice more to make sure the gods understood that they were happy. But then all of a sudden, if the crops weren't good, they felt like maybe the gods were angry at them. And so then they would have to sacrifice more. And it felt like over time, maybe um, the altar and the sacrifice and the gods and the goddesses were never appeased, and it just felt like it was never quite enough. And here's what we find, the statement right here. Go ahead and hit the next slide. You never knew where you stood with the gods. You never knew if you had done quite enough. So I was in Houston, Texas, uh, it's about six months ago, and I was visiting uh, the area. There's one of my favorite uh, scholars, a guy named N.T. Wright, was doing some lectures in town. And so I, I went with some friends, and we hung out for a few days in Houston. And on the day I was supposed to fly back, I stopped at one of these indie coffee shops. You ever seen some of these indie coffee shops? It's like you walk into a totally different world. You just don't know what's going on in that indie coffee shop. And this was one of those, like, really strange independent coffee shops you know like I'm smelling stuff I've never smelled before like I'm seeing things I haven't seen before and the barista behind the counter comes up to take my order and I look at her and it was like everything I could do to not have an uh like a reaction of shock I was like hey how are you because she had about I'm not kidding 20 piercings at different locations in her face. Now, my wife hates this about me, but I cannot leave stuff like that alone. I have to say something. <laughs> it's like, if you're going to have that many piercings on your face, you clearly don't mind if I talk about it because you're just showing me like I love piercings. So I just said to her, I said, hey, um, I see you have a lot of piercings on your face. Uh, I don't know if I said that, but I did say this. Hey, which of your piercings was the most painful? And she thought about it for a minute. She's like, oh, my gosh, it's definitely this one right here. And she pointed to one in her eyebrow. And, I mean, it was like it looked like it was going through the back of her skull, like into her eyebrow, around her lip or something. But it's like definitely this one right here. And I said, well, can I ask you another question? I said, why do you... Why do you do it if it hurts so bad, right? Why do you get so many piercings if they hurt so bad? And, and this is what she said to me. She said, uh, I don't know. I guess there's something about the rush of pain. I like the adrenaline. It makes me feel alive. And I thought, interesting. And the Holy Spirit in that moment gave me exactly the right words to say. And this is what I said to her. I said, so how many more piercings will it take to finally know 
that you're alive. Do you know what she said to me? I don't know. Maybe just a few more. I don't know. Maybe just a little more of an offering to the gods. I don't know. Maybe if I just do a little bit more, the gods will be happy with me. I'm not sure. Maybe just a little more money, a little more respect, one more piercing, just a few more tattoos, a few more friends, then that will be enough. So when you've offered all of your animals and you've offered all of your sacrifices and you have nothing left to offer and the gods are still angry with you and they still don't seem to be doing what you want them to do, they still seem to have kind of this sense of perhaps disappointment in your life. What do you have left to offer? The only thing you have left to offer is yourself. So in the Old Testament and in ancient Mesopotamia, we see this where priests and priestesses would begin to cut themselves and bleed themselves and find their own scars and wounds and offer up child sacrifice. And there was a festival, a festival in Asian Minor to the female goddess Kibbeleh who was the goddess of fertility and procreation and being a female deity, the men of that time wanted to worship her. And over time, a practice evolved where every springtime at this festival to Kibbeleh, all of these men would gather together. History tells us 5,000 men would gather and they would castrate themselves to identify with the goddess Kibbeleh. It's just a little... uh, friendly family dining conversation you guys can have after service here. Molech, an ancient god, detestable god, would would require the people to offer their children as sacrifices. We know the stories of the Mayans and the Incans and the Aztecs who would offer human sacrifices to the gods because it was just never quite enough. You never knew where you stood with the gods. It was never quite enough. There was always something more you had to do, which makes Genesis chapter 12 revolutionary in the history of religion. Say Genesis chapter 12. What are you talking about? Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, we're introduced to a man by the name of Abraham. And he hails from a country called Ur. Everyone just say Ur. Our collective IQ just dropped like 20 points right there. Ur. The Bible says that he lived at Ur with his father's household and all of their gods. And Ur was a place that the Lord was going to call Abraham from. And so here's what we see in Genesis Uh, Chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. This is revolutionary. So why is this revolutionary? It's revolutionary for a number of, of reasons, but primarily because God is actually taking the initiative to speak to his people. This never happened. This never happened. Things were always uncertain with the gods. You didn't know where you stood with the gods. You never knew what the gods wanted. But in this case, God says to Abram, I want you specifically to go to a new land that I'm going to show you. And he gets to the kind of along the journey with a number of people. And God says, I want to make a covenant with you. I am God, and I want to make a covenant with you. Now, back in the day, covenants were also very bloody practices. In fact, if two parties wanted to sort of be in unity with one another to cut a covenant together, which is how they described it, you would cut a covenant. Essentially what you would do is this. You would take animals and you would line these animals up essentially in a row and you would slit the animal. I'm not going to get too, well, anyway, like this, okay, up through the throat And obviously, as you cut these animals into two halves, you'd put the animal halves on each side of this line of what eventually would be blood. And this blood covenant, there would be be literally just foul-smelling, pungent blood running between the pieces of these animals. And two parties would come together. This is like heavy stuff, right? This is serious stuff because this would be like two tribes pledging themselves to each other, two people pledging themselves. 
And you would walk between the pieces, and, and you would kind of walk with your partner between the pieces, then you would oftentimes slit the bottom of your, the palm of your hand and other planes, you would rub the blood together. There was all these ceremonies that went into the covenant process. And God says, I want to, co- I want to cut a covenant with you, Abram. The only difference about this covenant is I'm going to put you to sleep when the ceremony starts. And I'm going to be the only one to go through the pieces. In other words, when you break your side of the covenant, I've pledged myself to myself that I am making a covenant with you and I will bear the consequences of that. That's a big deal. So if you read Genesis 15, you see this ceremony where they cut these animals in half and Abram uh, is put asleep and, and God, through the image of this kind of sort of smoking fire pot imagery goes through the pieces and God commits a covenant to his people, Abraham. Now, eventually, Abraham, because God was pledging that he would have a lot of descendants, had a son. And we all know that, right? Because we grew up in church, uh, many of us, and we know Father Abraham had many sons. And many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them. And so are you. So we've got that going for us right now. Uh, So let's just praise the Lord right now. If you didn't grow up in the church, you're just like, I have no idea why people are laughing right now. But it was an old Sunday school song. And so in Genesis 22, 2, when God says to Abraham these words, take your son, take your only son Isaac. I know you love him. But I want you to go to the land of Moriah, and I want you to offer him as a burnt offering. Excuse me, you know. I want you to offer your son, Abraham, you know that son that you love so much, as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And this is where all the people in modern society read the Bible and they say things like, that is so toxic. Religion is so toxic. I cannot believe that God would tell somebody, like, I want to see that you have faith in me. And if you have enough faith in me, then I'm not going to make you sacrifice your son. But I want you to kill your son to prove that you have, that is so barbaric. You don't get it. You don't get it. This is what the gods required this is how the gods acted this is this is how the gods did things the bible was not written in a vacuum the the bible was written among a group of people and here's the key to this as soon as abraham had the knife in the air and he was about ready to come down and kill his son do you know what happened in the story god said stop don't do it I see you fear me like the other gods, but I want to show you something, Abraham. I'm not like the other gods. That's the power of the story. We read the story and we think it's some whacked up, jacked up, abusive. Why would God manipulate Abraham's emotions like that? Listen, back in that day, Abraham probably took his son and was like, all right, that's what the gods require. That's what gods do. Gods require things like that to appease them. And God says, I'm not like that. I'm not like that. He says, check that out over there. I'm going to provide the lamb. I'm going to provide the sacrifice for you because I'm different than other gods. So I remember a girl in my youth group. This was a number of years ago, and uh, this girl in my youth group used to, to cut herself. And I remember thinking, this is such a strange practice. Why is this girl cutting herself like why would you ever cut yourself and I started to hear her story a little bit and I began to realize uh, that she had a real real difficult childhood she had a lot of verbal abuse she was neglected her parents divorced she carried a lot of guilt she carried a lot of shame she thought it was her fault it was her her problem and she couldn't figure out how to get rid of the guilt and the shame and so she tried a lot of things she tried to hang out with boys. She slept with some boys. She, she tried drugs. She tried alcohol. Nothing could take away this sense in her spirit that she had pain and guilt and shame. And no matter what she tried to do, she couldn't seem to appease the gods. And she got really anxious and she got really depressed. And she felt like the only thing I can do 
to feel again, to feel something again, is to cut myself and to bleed. It was never quite enough. No matter what she did, it was just never quite enough. She, she could never quite feel like she was okay with God. And much like that woman, that barista, who said, maybe just a few more, this girl said, maybe if I cut myself, I'll start to feel again. God created a nation out of Abraham. God created a nation out of the Israelites. We know the story of Moses. He delivered them from uh, the Egyptians. And on the night when they were about to leave Egypt to go into the promised land, God said something very specific to Moses. This is what he said to Moses. He said, I want you to take the blood of a lamb, and I want you to, to take that blood. I want you to splatter it on the door frames of your home. And when you have the blood of the lamb on the door frames of your home, then I will pass over you. You'll be okay, and you'll get out of Egypt alive. This is what he says. The blood shall be a sign for you. On the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And so, at Mount Sinai, he further establishes his covenant with his people. In the ancient world, there were gods and goddesses for just about everything, but this god said, I am who I am. I am the one and only God, the one and only true God. I control the heavens and the earth, and I want to show you how to find peace with me. You don't have to struggle anymore to try to find peace with me. I'm going to show you how to find peace with me. And so he began to lay out the law in Exodus, the tabernacle, the temple, what lambs to offer, bulls to offer, how the sacrifice works. Anyone here ever read Leviticus? It feels like a B-rated slasher movie, right? If you don't know what this is all about, why in the world is this in the Bible? Well, because check it out. God is showing his people how to come into fellowship with him and have peace with him through the sacrificial system. He is showing them the process. When you do this, you take this animal and you do it this way with this priest at this tabernacle at this time, and then it's all good. And then once a year, you're going to come into here in the high, Holy of Holies. You're going to offer this sacrifice here, and it's all going to be good. And I'm going to show you the process that is required, that is needed. And and as you think about that, as you think about this whole story and, and everything else, Mount Sinai, the covenant, everything, over time the Israelites as a nation began to evolve and they began to grow. And the first temple was constructed. And then under King Herod, the second temple was constructed in Jerusalem. And there was this whole system of sacrifice, of blood and lambs and bulls and goats and how to be at peace with God and God's favor on his people and walking in holiness and essentially, it went something like this. Follow the religious rules, and you'll be at peace with God. Follow the sacrificial system, you'll be at peace with God. Pursue holiness, you'll be at peace with God. Second temple was built. Uh, if you could have seen this temple that they built, where hundreds of thousands of sacrifices were offered every year, 2.3 million stones is how big this temple was that King Herod built for the Israelites. And every day and every year, animals would be brought to this temple to offer sacrifices to God. And one time a year at Passover, there were hundreds of thousands of pilgrims that would come, and they would offer these sacrifices in this massive system of priests and um, offerings. But here's the deal, guys. Going back to Hebrews 9.22, uh, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So I want you to think about this for a minute. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. I want you to think about Passover for a moment. 
And I want you to think about a line of 250,000 people holding lambs and methodically sacrificing them one after the other after the other. Historians tell us that the blood ran from the altar back towards a back area down into the valley of Kidron Valley into the river and that the river was literally the color of blood. There was blood everywhere. There was blood all over the temple, the sacrifice, the river, the smell, the death, the sin, the destruction. And month after month and year after year, people would continue to make these sacrifices to make peace with God. And the problem with the whole system, the problem with the whole thing was the fact that the blood of bulls and goats and lambs could never change the human heart. And so what happened is people would just continue to offer more and more sacrifice, but they kept falling into sin and they could never quite change the heart. And the whole process there was something greater that needed to come, something better, something that would actually bring transformation. What was that? Look at Hebrews 10, 1 through 4. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, right? It was like the law was like this tutor that was tutoring people to show them that like there's something deeper, bigger, better, a, a greater reality behind it. The law can never, by the same sacrifices continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins. Every year, it's not the way it should be. Something is wrong, for it is impossible for the blood of goat, bulls and goats to take away sin. It's impossible. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And you should feel in your spirit right now a collective sense, I hate to say it this way, but almost like, how will this ever end? <laughs> how will we ever come out of this system with so much blood and death and sacrifice? So I met with a fairly wealthy business leader. And this person had all the appearances of success, uh, multiple homes, multiple cars, a beautiful wife, had kids, had everything going for him, looked the part, acted the part, talked the part, but man, he worked hard. He worked really hard. And I remember having lunch with him and talking to him a little bit about his job and his profession and all this kind of thing. And I began to explain his hours. You know, 60, 70 hours a week. And, and I started to say, well, tell me about your family. Tell me about your parents. He goes, oh, you don't want to hear about my dad. Oh, well, tell me more about your dad. Uh, my dad was, uh, and he just, he just, you could tell his whole countenance changed. He was an alcoholic, was an awful father, didn't care for us, in and out of poverty, never knew where we stood. Um, yeah. Like, man, you know, you could just tell something's wrong. And essentially, in the process, I started to realize that this wealthy man, this businessman, his goal in life, like his ultimate goal in life, was not to be like his dad. That was like the driving motivation of his life. But what happened is, no matter how much he made and no matter how many possessions he acquired, it was like it was just never quite enough to get rid of the hole in his heart and the anger and bitterness he had towards his father. It was just never quite enough. He could never quite find peace in his life. And I feel like inside of every man and woman, inside of the heart of every boy and girl, there is this sense, there is this longing that you want to be at peace with you don't even know what. The God of the universe, yourself, your friends, your relationships. There is a longing in every one of our hearts to just finally feel like we've, we've done enough. We've arrived. We're accepted. We're loved. We're forgiven. We don't have to keep proving ourselves to people. Like we can actually enjoy relationship and and there's a longing for that you know and so i feel like sometimes 
you know, in this whole process of things, even among Christians sometimes, we walk out of the fact of what God's done for us, and we just keep striving longing, wanting. You see it in your unsaved friends and neighbors. Maybe some of you today are feeling this way, like, gosh, I just feel like no matter what I do, it's never enough. No matter how much I have, it's never enough. I feel like I can't get rid of this feeling in my heart, and I try to cover it with all kinds of things, but it's just never enough. And maybe I try to do a lot of religious things and religious goods and services, and I go to church and I read the Bible, but I always feel the same. I just feel like it's never quite enough. And let me just tell you something. Because this is where the story begins to twist. God looks down at a young woman in Houston, standing behind a coffee shop bar with piercings all over her face, who is trying so hard to finally feel something. And God looks down and says, that's not good. God looks at this young girl who has tried to find acceptance and try to remove the guilt and the shame that she feels in her heart by turning to other men and drugs and alcohol and finally turning to cutting herself. And he looks down and he says, that's not good. And this wealthy businessman who is trying so hard to earn earn something to sort of kill the ghosts of his past that he can't seem to quite do enough to remove. And God looks down in incredible love, and he says, that's not good. A line of 250,000 people offering lambs as blood sacrifices to try to appease God and make peace with him. And God loved the world so much. God looked down at this whole process, this whole system, and in the fullness of time, God said, Son, and Jesus came. And when Jesus came, the first words out of John the Baptist's mouth, when he came, and you'll see this in the book of John, Jesus came walking to the River Jordan. The very first words out of John the Baptist's mouth when he saw Jesus is he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who makes peace with humanity, who dies on our behalf. And look at what it says in Hebrews 9.26. I love this. He has appeared. Jesus has appeared once and for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Fully God, fully man, loves the world, pure and spotless, dies on a cross as the ultimate sacrifice so that we don't have to keep striving. So religion always says, do this, do that, do this. And Jesus says, I already did it. It's done. I've sacrificed myself, amen? I've sacrificed myself on the cross on your behalf. I made a covenant with you, and you didn't walk through the pieces. I did. And I want you to know I'm pledging myself to you. I love you so much, and I see you're striving. And you got to stop that. Look to the cross, right? So listen, I want to show you a picture. And it was completed between 1635 and 1640 by a Spanish artist. And the work is called Agnus Dei, which in Latin just means Lamb of God. And it's a simple picture. You'll see it in a minute. A woolly lamb lying on its side on a gray slab, all four of its feet bound together with two strands of cords. The animal's back makes kind of a hump. You'll see it in a minute. The left eye of the lamb is open, its gaze directed down at the gray slab on which it lies as if in resignation, knowing what it needs to do on the behalf of all humanity. And there's no blood in the painting. The lamb is alive, destiny sealed, there's light on the lamb, behind it is only darkness, and I just want you to look at this for just a minute, and I want you to let the gravity of this picture sit with you for a minute, that this is the ultimate sacrifice. There are no other sacrifices necessary. You don't have to do anything else. 
You don't have to keep trying to earn God's favor and approval. You just have to behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So just behold the Lamb of God. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down on my own accord because I love, I love the world. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And I just want to say this to you. If you're a follower of Jesus, will you stop striving to win his approval and rest in the fact that he's died for you and loves you? And would you not be just motivated by the love he has for you instead of trying to earn his acceptance all over again? And if you're not a follower of Jesus, can I just say this to you? God has died on your behalf because he loves you infinitely more than anything else in this world. And he's asking you today to surrender yourself to him. Now, there's an old song that I'm hesitant to sing, but I'm going to do it. Because when I was a kid, I'd grow up in my, my grandma's church, and I remember they used to, used to sing this song, and, and I've never forgotten it. And uh, it just goes <laughs> something like this, right? What can wash away my sin? You remember it? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me White as snow, no other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know, that may seem strange if you're not familiar with this whole process and this story. But I, can I just tell you that that song encapsulates the truest reality there is in this world and the fact that the sacrifice of God, of Jesus Christ himself, washes all our sin away. Would you just bow your heads with me? God, you are so good. You are not like the other gods. You don't ask us to appease you. You don't ask us to continue to cut ourselves and slay ourselves and strive. You're different than the other gods. The other gods demand sacrifice. They want the son to be killed. But when the knife is raised, you say, stop. That's not how I operate. I'll provide the lamb. You saw us in our sinfulness, Lord. You saw us in our hopeless. And you provided an intermediary way through the blood of lambs and bulls and goats, but those sacrifices can never ultimately take away sin. But when you died in the perfect moment in time through Jesus Christ, when you died on that cross, you took away through one sacrifice, all sin for all time, and our job is to simply trust you, to rest in you, to say, I believe in you. I throw myself at your feet. I worship you. If there's anyone in my voice here today and you say, man, I've never done that. But today, Pastor John, I'm sensing in my spirit that, that I need to make that decision and I need to surrender to the one who's died on my behalf. Then I would encourage you, please make that decision today. For those of you that are striving, just stop striving and rest in the sacrifice of Christ. Abide in him and throw yourself on him. He has already made a way. God, we love you and we thank you for the good news. We thank you for the hope we have. 
We worship you and we ask this all in the name of Jesus, the one who went before us. Amen. Amen. Would you all stand with me? I want to sing this song as we close. And I think as you, as you just share the lyrics, allow it to wash over you. Um, Jesus is enough. Amen. Amen.